Amen. We'll go ahead and grab a seat. Good to see you tonight. I um, want to give a shout out to Cherie, who normally she's the one that hands out the, the handout at the door, but she went in for brain surgery this week, uh, yesterday. And uh, on Tuesday, she had this huge tumor that was growing all around the base of her brain and, you know, touching the spinal column, brain stem, and all. I mean, it was, and so she went in early Tuesday morning, and uh, it was amazing. She was in for, they were expecting an eight-hour surgery. It ended up taking them only two hours, and they got the thing out through her nose, and, and uh you know, they said, there, and it's also benign, so, and they said there are a few little pieces left in there, but it's no big deal. They just keep an eye on it, and so um, she was coming out of surgery. She was sharp. She was giving God the glory, and, and then she texted me just a little while ago to find out if tonight's on Facebook Live. She's still in ICU, but she's watching tonight, and so, you know, we just want to praise God for that miracle that he did. And then uh, keep Mike Coletta in your prayers. Many of you know Mike. He's gone to our church for many years, helps really involved with the Mexico ministry, helps up in the sound booth with video. And uh, Mike had a, he, he says it's a mild stroke. His daughter says it's a moderate stroke, but he he's over in Mission Hospital and he has uh, his left side, his left arm and leg, he, he can move them, and I, like I held it, and he could push against it. He has some good strength, but the fine motor skills aren't there yet, and Mike has a, you know, just a real, he, he always has a crotchety attitude anyway, and he does not want to be in the hospital. He had the stroke on Tuesday. He didn't go to the hospital till Sunday, so finally decided, yeah, I can't, use, I can't walk. <laughs> I should probably do this. But uh, the, if you know Mike, that's Mike. But keep him in your prayers that he will, you know, heal up quickly and, and be able to get out of there. Today he was, Jerry and I went and prayed with him, and he was just complaining about the food in the hospital. And usually that's a pretty good sign when that's your greatest concern. And then Vito, the little guy that usually sits back there, as many of you know Vito, um, he has he's had a lot of physical challenges, but he has a blood cancer, and so he's in the VA hospital, and they're working on him, so keep him in your prayers as well. And let's just go ahead and pray for all these things. Lord, we just give you so, all the glory for what you've done in Cherie. She had, going into surgery, she, was, she felt like, hey, if I die, I'm fine. I'm totally happy. And so for you to bless us with such great results from the surgery is so awesome because you love her, and you still have so much for her to do. And, and her, I know that was her thought was, I just can't wait. If, if God allows me to make it through this, I just want to do so much more for the Lord. So God, help her to feel your love, your presence. Help her to be patient in healing from major surgery like this. There's always going to be some ramifications. And so just please give her strength and continue to work in her and and for Mike, as he has this problem on his left side, and he'll be probably getting into a rehab place in a couple days and, and working with therapy and everything to develop his coordination and strength back and all, just please help him to see that there's something you're doing in all of this and to receive it as being from you. And for Vito, we pray that you would touch him and heal him Give him a peace also that passes understanding and help him to just know very strongly that you are there. And I thank you that the way he just cheers everyone up whenever he's around, that you're using him in that VA hospital, a place that could really use it. Now, help us as we, as we look at your word to really understand what it is that you want us to understand tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, the topic for tonight, and if you haven't been with us, we're in a series called Need to Know, where we're just going through some of the most important basic things that as Christians we need to know about or we need to be reminded of. Like, how you become a Christian, you know, how, do you, how do you live your life? How do you do life well? And tonight we're talking about knowing God's will. Um, 
we, you know, uh, most of us all the time are kind of in a quandary because we have decisions to make. You know, do I take this job, that job? Do I look here? Do I look there? Do I move here? Do I go there? Do I stay associated with this person or do I withdraw from them? Do, you know, we're constantly making decisions. And it's one of the great challenges of our lives. But one of the things that makes it so difficult for us is we have this idea that everything that we do, God has a perfect way of us doing it. And sometimes we're almost paralyzed by that. And, and so as a result, we're like, what do I do? What do I do? And we feel like, we feel like our lives are um, hopelessly entangled in our inability to magically understand God's specific will for us. And, and uh, God doesn't want us to live that way. And so we're going to look at a lot of scriptures, and you have them on your handout. Um, if you didn't get a handout, there would be some in the back, I'm sure. But we just want to look, and I don't know how many of these scriptures we'll have time to look up, but we'll at least talk about the basics that are contained in these scriptures. A lot of them are in Proverbs because... The book of Proverbs is all about wisdom. And wisdom is all about making smart decisions. And so we find an awful lot in Proverbs that really helps us to uh, be able to figure out, okay, how do I know what God wants me to do and how do I do it? So first of all, some preliminary considerations. Before we even talk about, okay, I have a specific issue or I have a specific decision, these are some conditions that, that really will determine whether or not everything else even works or not. And so uh, Proverbs 21.5 is the first one, if you flip over there in your phone or iPad or in your Bible. In Proverbs 21.5 it says, the plans of the diligent, um, the plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty but those of everyone who is hasty, surely to poverty. So the first thing that it's important, I think, for us to recognize here is this shouldn't be a hurry. We should, when we're trying to figure out God's will, it's not a rush. As we're seeing going through the Gospel of John, we've seen it in the other Gospels as well, Jesus was never in a hurry. As soon as we are hurrying, hurrying can cause us to make bad decisions. Hurrying can cause us to miss God's will because sometimes he wants us to wait as he is working in our lives in some way. And so, you know, that's the thing that I want to look at. You know, right off the top is like, if you're rushing, chances are you will probably miss what God's best is for you because you're feeling compulsed. And that's why as much as possible, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you have a major life choice that faces you right this second. Planning ahead kind of helps you to avoid that. Some of them are unavoidable. Sometimes you just have a quick decision to make, and, but we'll talk about that later. But So first of all, don't rush. Proverbs 13, 20. In this passage, Solomon says, He who walks with wise people will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. So hanging out with people who are wise helps make you wise. Hanging out with stupid people makes you stupid. It's, it's kind of a basic principle that the people you hang around rub off on you. And therefore, I see some of you moving away from each other right now. <laughs> but it might be a good thing for both of you, I don't know. But it's to, to think, if I want a life where I am actually knowing God's will, where I'm actually doing things and looking back on it and going, whoa, that was a great decision. I'm so glad that I did that. Start with, who is it that you even spend time with? Because you will tend to become like whoever it is that you spend a lot of time with. So seek out relationships with people who you see make good decisions. That's what wisdom is. And as you spend time with people who make good decisions, um, it helps you to make better decisions yourself. Sometimes we like hanging out with people who make poor decisions because it makes us feel smarter, but it doesn't work that way. People who make poor decisions, you hang out with them, their decision-making rubs off on you. 
So be kind of ruthless in terms of who you're going to spend time. Now, you have to associate with all kinds of people for sure, but make sure that there are people in your life who have shown some wisdom because it actually is contagious. And so associate with wise people, not with, not with foolish people. Then Proverbs 18.1, and this is really a, an important verse where he says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. And then he continues and says, a fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. So being isolated, being without friends, being like keeping your distance from everyone, it, it causes you to end up going kind of crazy. We are designed to be, you know, in relationships. And again, that's why in the first, you know, don't hurry, but then don't associate with fools, associate with wise people. Here in this scripture in 18.1, it gives another version of that. There are some people who are like, I don't associate with foolish people, but I don't really associate with wise people either. I kind of do my own thing. Doing your own thing, being isolated, being without outward connections is a foolish way to live your life. I, as an introvert, I totally understand the appeal to isolationism. I sometimes, you know, crave isolation at, at different times. I appreciate it. But I understand also that I will become more foolish if I am not associating with other people. Life is not meant to be lived by yourself. It's one of the reasons why we really encourage people to get involved in small groups. Because, and, and it's what we saw this week and in having, you know, like Cherie being in the hospital and Mike being in the hospital, and there's all these people there. Well, where did they come from? Mostly from their small groups. They're, they're the people that do life with them. And so, to guaranteed, if you don't involve other people in your life, if you just kind of are, are an isolationist, you, that will lead you to making bad decisions, having bad judgment. Finally, in Psalm 119, 105, um, and you can look at it or not, it's a verse that you're probably familiar with, where David says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The word of God has an amazing way of lighting your path. It, it, it has an amazing way of leading you. And, but again, it's his word, not that like scrambling for a verse that's going to tell me what to do. It's living a life of reading the Bible constantly, building up your understanding and your repertoire of what the scripture says, that then in the moment you have a basis of something that's inspired by God. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. So the word of God, if it's a big part of your life, is a big part of preparing you for knowing God's will. And because there are a lot of things that you might think God's telling you to do, and then you know there's a verse that lets you know, no, obviously that isn't what he wants me to do. That isn't how he wants me to live. So the last of my preliminary considerations is be a person of the word of God. Spend time in the word. Not looking specifically for anything, but just reading what the Bible says, soaking up its wisdom. I always encourage people, read a chapter of Proverbs every day. There's 31 of them, so do the one that's you know for the day of the month and, and just read it because then you're, having God's word come into you, and sometimes you'll be amazed. It's like, whoa, I needed that today. But other times, it just goes in there in your library. It's filed, and when you get into a situation, God's word addresses it. But, but all of the Bible is kind of that way. So be a person of the word before you are even a person of, like, what does God want me to do? Now, the primary steps that I have here are some things to do just starting out with wanting to know God's will before you get into the nuts and bolts of it. And, and over in James chapter 1, we have this um, 
great uh, teaching from James, the brother of Jesus, on prayer. And he says, James 1, beginning with verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, okay, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And, you know, James also says, there are times when you have not because you ask not. But the point here is, if you want wisdom, you need to ask God for wisdom. You need to ask God to even show you where it is that you need wisdom. What, not just, how do I make this decision, but... God, show me the decisions that are coming up and, and lead me through this. You should never be worrying about what God's will is if you haven't even asked him to do that. And as James says, it's asking with confidence. It's asking not being wishy-washy. It's just tell God what you want. When you pray, you don't have to use flowery language. You don't have to think about... This is one of the reasons why in the Bible most prayer is done when you're by yourself. Because when you're by yourself, you don't have to think about what I say might offend somebody or, you know, I don't know if they'll understand it or you end up doing a news story in your prayer to let people know what you know. Um, but, but when you pray by yourself, God knows everything. You can just get right to the point and ask him, God, I am asking you to do this. And when it comes to wisdom, it's, it's sort of a no-brainer. You've got to pray. You will never get God's wisdom if you don't ask for it because we all lack wisdom. And James says, you lack wisdom, ask God. So that's something, that's one of the early things that we need to do when we want his wisdom. And then over in Proverbs chapter 2, and this is another one that almost should go without saying, and yet it's, Solomon talks about it in several places as do other parts of Scripture. But Proverbs 2, beginning with verse 1, my son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so again, you're reading the Bible and receiving it, so that you incline your ear to wisdom, you need to listen for wisdom, and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment, you're asking, and lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. And, so, and he goes on a little bit more on it. But the, the point here is, not only do you need to ask for it, but what Solomon describes there is, you need to look for it. You need to look for it diligently. You can't just be flippant about it. When you ask God for it, you need to be committed to it. You know, you also need to be going, God, I want to know what you want me to do so that I can do it. I think sometimes when people want to know God's will, they just want to know what God's will is so they can decide whether or not they want to do it. There's, there's a preliminary step, a, a most elementary, primary thing that we have to ask ourselves, if I think I know what God wants me to do, am I willing to do it? Or do I have a list of things that I won't do whether he tells me it's his will or not? We shouldn't be afraid to be willing to do God's will because God's will is always going to be best for us. And we really can't ask him, but at the same time say, there are certain things I'm not going to do. I'll let you know that right now. And so here it's like, it's, it's not easy. It's not just going to happen he, God rewards those who diligently seek him. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And here, for those who diligently look for wisdom with a heart to obey it, um, those are the people that end up finding the wisdom. It's not always easy. And then in Proverbs 18, 15, kind of related to this a little bit in terms of a, a diligent search, Proverbs 18, 15 says, the heart of the prudent, a prudent person is somebody who has good judgment and is 
being careful and really trying to live their life right. The heart of the prudent acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. So what he's saying here is, you need to do some research. When you know that there's a decision that you need to make, you don't just sit there and magically think that God's going to show you what to do. The more information that you have, the easier it is for God to cause some of that information to jump out at you, to cause you to discover some things that once you find those things out, it'll be very clear as to which way you're going to go. So when you know that something's coming up, you don't just spend your time waiting on God and like, okay, God, show me. Do your research. Look for information. That's what wise people do. They try to get as many of the facts as they can. Now, a lot of people overdo this. They just they have all the information, but they just keep looking for more anyway. Now, you got to know when it's like, I think I have all the information that I need to make a decision. But you should never make a decision presuming that it's God's will if you haven't actually done your homework. And so that's why I have this as one of the primary steps. Not only looking diligently for it and praying you know, without wavering, but do your research. And then in, turn over a couple of pages to Proverbs 20 and verse 18. Plans are established by counsel. By wise counsel, wage war. Now, getting counsel from others doesn't mean you let other people make your decision. It doesn't even make, it doesn't even mean that you will do what the majority of the people that you know think you should do. The decision is yours always. Your ability to make decisions, your will, your free will that God has given you is the most amazing and profound gift that God gave humankind. And, you know, it, it's, it's actually, without that being so valuable, God could have made the world much easier without giving people the opportunity to sin without even creating the devil, knowing that he was going to rebel, why is it that God, knowing that the devil would rebel, made him anyway? Why is it that knowing that Adam and Eve were going to sin and damage the race, the human race that God loved so much, knowing that his son would ultimately have to die for this, why did God even allow that? It's a question a lot of people ask. But the answer has to have something to do with the fact that God values your autonomy and your ability to choose. So he holds that as sacred, unless you're a Calvinist, in which case you're just a robot. But for anyone who thinks about life in a serious way at all, you, you realize, wow, I can do this or I can do that, and God holds you accountable based on choices that you make. But that doesn't mean you do it by yourself. A part of your research needs to be getting other people's advice, um, getting their counsel, going to people who you consider to be wise and saying, what do you think about this situation? And, but again, it's your decision, ultimately. And you should never get counsel from someone who is personally invested that if you won't do what they think, then they don't want to be your friend anymore. That's a good way to find out. I'm not going to get counsel from that person. There are some people who I really love. They're great people and smart people. But I just know I can't ask them for their take because they're going to be bugged at me if I don't agree with their decision and I don't make that decision. So you find people who have an, a, a wisdom, but at the same time, they are people who appreciate and value your right to choose. And they tell you, hey, this is a big decision that you have to make. Here's some things that you ought to think about, but I will support you in whatever you decide to do. That's what a good counselor does. A bad counselor gets all emotionally invested. And, you know, I mean, I, I would say of all the counseling that I do, 80% of the time they don't take my advice at all. But that's okay. I still love them. I don't be like, okay, if you don't do this, then I'm never going to see you again. No, it's your decision. And I, my counsel almost always is, 
Boy, you need to really get close to God, hear from him, and do what he shows you to do. I don't want you doing anything based on what I think. Because then you might be, I'm smarter than you, you might be doing a better thing, but you might be doing a good thing for the wrong reason. And I don't want anybody to do right things for the wrong reasons. I would rather have somebody do the wrong thing for a right reason, taking responsibility for themselves. So finding someone who (coughs) is going to be objective, who's going to support you. And it's one of the great blessings that I think we have in this church with all of our pastors and with Kenny and Jerry and, and, the, and Anson and all these guys is I don't know any one of them who, if you go to them for counsel, they're gonna be mad at you if you don't take their advice. They're all like gonna put it back on you, but they'll go, here's some things that you might wanna think about. That's, what, that's a part of a primary step. Hey, find someone that you respect and just get their take on it, get their advice. They may think of something that you're not gonna think of, or you may be biased in a particular direction, and they might go, yeah, you could do that, but here's some other things to think about. And so, again, Proverbs is big on, and think about Solomon. Solomon had a bunch of counselors, and he was the wisest man who ever lived, and he was wise enough to listen to what other people had to say as well. So if Solomon needed counsel, then we do too. And again, that comes back to the whole point about being isolated. If you're isolated and you don't have friends and you're just kind of doing this on your own, you're a fool. It's, you need to be close to other people, get their take on it, do all the research, get as much information as you can before you you make a decision. Now, Before we get right into the process, here are some roadblocks that you need to avoid. In in your life, as you have decisions that you need to make, here are some some stumbling blocks that can trip you up. Proverbs 14 and verse 12. Solomon says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Uh, This appears like three times in the book of Proverbs, by the way. So the idea there is there is something that seems like the obvious thing to do, and some of them will destroy you. So one roadblock is to just assume that you know what you're supposed to do. Um, To just go, you know what, and even the idea of, you know, I feel like this. Now, your feelings can betray you. Your feelings all the time will make you feel like doing something that you don't want to do. That's usually what gets us into a mess. That's because in, in our fallen state, we can often have an inclination that it's like, after I've had a tough day, I want to eat everything that's bad for me. And I totally feel like doing that. But that's not God. That's not wisdom. That's stupid, I have to realize. Just be, and, I, and I think I read a book recently that talked about the, the, the fact that basically your brain is kind of programmed and it can tell you to do things, but your soul or your heart or you, the real you can look at it and go, my brain is telling me to do this, but my soul as I'm, my self-consciousness, my spirit, the place I'm connected to God, can allow me to see independently that that's not really the best thing to do. So just don't jump on whatever it is that is your first inclination. Often it can be wrong. Um, Proverbs 14, 17, the same chapter, he goes on and says, a quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of wicked intentions is hated. Don't make decisions when you're mad. Most of the decisions that you make in a hurry, out of anger, are gonna blow up in your face. It's why sometimes when you're feeling yourself getting in a fight with somebody, the smartest thing to do is not to give them your wisdom. It's to call a timeout and go, let me go pray about this and and take a walk and then we can talk about it. You really, it's, it's one of the dangers of modern communications where people, you know, they can so easily text message you and you can instantly answer back. 
there was something to be said for when people had to write a letter out and then find a stamp and an envelope and walk to the, and you're like, eh, I don't think I, I might want to change this a little bit. So, but we need to certainly understand that when it comes to our temper, that the temper is not going to lead you to wisdom. It's not going to lead you to God's will. So you got to calm down to where anger isn't, isn't a part of, of your th- thought process if you really want to have wisdom. And then in Proverbs 29, verse 5, he says, 29.25, I'm sorry. I'm like, that's a man who flatters his neighbor. 29.25, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. So being afraid of what people think of you is one of the greatest traps that you'll ever fall into. If instead of fearing man, you trust God, you'll be safe. So one of the roadblocks that will cause us to short circuit God's will in our lives is if we're worrying about what people think. Because then I'm not like really wanting God's will, I'm wanting to please people. The Bible makes it really clear over and over again. You cannot please God and please people. Most of us were raised and socialized to be people pleasers. I mean, more than we even realize. Our culture, our society, does that in a way that's absolutely unprecedented in all of history. Because never has there been so much of an emphasis on, you know, that your connections to others, if you're ever going to get a job, then you have to do this, and, you know, people aren't going to like you if you do that, and, oh, what do they think of me, and how do I look, and how do... I mean, we're bombarded, and that is a trap. And that doesn't mean... And for a lot of people, what they do is it's like, boy, you know, every time I try to please people, I do stupid things, so now I'm just not going to listen to them at all. Now, sometimes when you don't please people, it's because you're being a jerk... But you can't let the fear of man be a determining factor in what you ultimately choose to do. Because a lot of times, in fact, in almost everything you do, there are going to be some people who think less of you whatever decision that you make. It's something that I realize as a pastor that every time we do anything, you know, and we're praying about it, we're seeking the Lord, any change that you make in a church or just about anything that you say in front of people, there are going to be some people who are displeased with it. And I've had to come to, and I like to please people, believe it or not, but at the same time, I've had to come to a thing where it's like, I really need to do what I think God wants me to do, and if people don't like it, it's not that I don't care what they think, I care deeply what they think, but I care more about what God does, and so we can miss God's will because we are obsessing on what people think. Even people that really love us, even our parents or somebody close to us, you can't do it that way. You and you alone have certain responsibilities, and if you're thinking, what are other people going to think, you're just letting other people make your decisions. And the ironic thing is, if you change a decision based on what you're afraid somebody's going to think, you're probably going to end up displeasing even more people when you do it. Because I don't know if you've noticed, people don't agree. People have different perspectives. If you, you know, you get into a room of 10 people and you have 15 opinions on most things, because some of them are changing even as you talk. Well, on the other hand, and on the other hand, so a, a huge roadblock to finding God's will is our obsession with people pleasing our fear of what they think. You can't, there's something psychologically broken in you if you don't care what people think. We we should care deeply what people think, and then we should say, but I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to do what I believe is the right thing to do. I love you, you can be mad at me, I I hate to even tell you what I'm going to do, but ultimately I've already decided I'm going to do what I think God wants me to do, and I'm not going to let my fear of you cause me to end up making a decision that I really don't feel connected to, that I don't really, that I don't really believe in. And then 
Finally, and you don't need to turn there, but Ephesians 5.18 talks about being filled with the Spirit. And it contrasts it with, don't be drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And what I'm suggesting there is that, and not just with alcohol, but all kinds of drugs and sometimes other substances, we don't do our best thinking when we are on the, under the influence of something other than the Holy Spirit. And he could have said, don't overeat, but be filled with the Spirit. Because when I've eaten too much, I'm giving up control in some ways to all of my faculties because now they're working hard trying to digest all this food. So, but certainly medication that, that alters your consciousness, um, alcohol that numbs and brings you to a certain level. If, if you have an issue with um, any kind of an addiction at all, um, and it, I'm not being simplistic and like, well, just don't do it. But what I'm suggesting is you want to make your decisions at a time when you are in your right mind. You want to make your decisions at a time when you are thinking clearly. Now, this also goes, by the way, if it's all about being controlled by the Spirit, it means that sometimes when you're really tired, that's not a good time to make decisions. Sometimes if you are really depressed, it's not a good time to make decisions. Understand that influences from outside or influences with inside, you want to hear God's will, you need to do it at a time when you are clear-headed and, you know, uh, you know, other than that, hey, try to hold off. It's why when someone loses a loved one, a spouse dies, child dies, something like that, we always tell people, don't make any major decisions for six months because you're just not in a position to think clearly, and that affects your ability to tune into God's will, because you're, you're kind of not in your right mind. And so I think that, you know, here Solomon would, or uh, Paul in Ephesians would just allow us to understand and know this is something being controlled by the Spirit involves also by the process of elimination, not being controlled by other things that tend to control you. And I you know, I don't think you should make really big decisions when you're hungry either, or when you're too full. It affects your judgment. I, I don't think you should make a decision when you're really lonely or when you're very depressed or when you, you've been eating too much or drinking too much or, you know, if you're on, on medication that affects your capacity to think clearly. Make decisions when you are as clear-headed as you can because apparently the control of the Holy Spirit, filling of the Spirit, is adversely affected by other exigent circumstances, and that's something that we don't want to trip up on that. Now, the, the big verse on knowing God's will, and it's what, when I'm not joking around, I usually tell people this is my life verse, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, and you may know it already, but you can turn to it if, you have, if you're not super familiar with it where Solomon says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Let's start at the end. If we do these things, Solomon says, God will direct your path. Isn't that what we want when we're saying, I want the will of God? We want him to direct where we go, what we do, decisions that we make for him to direct our path. And so what he says the process of that looks like is, first of all, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. It means I am not going to, you know, think what God's will is, and maybe I'll do it and maybe I, maybe I won't, but I'm also going to start out with the assumption that it's going to be okay. Uh, in the same way that drugs and alcohol and other conditions, being too tired or being sick or whatever can affect your judgment, um, I think in a lot of ways, when it comes to just knowing that it's going to be okay, it takes a certain clarity to be able to say, I'm trusting you with all my heart. So 
how, what does trust in him look like? Trusting in him means that I'm okay with however this turns out. Now, most of us live our lives scared to death of what might happen. So when somebody that we love is sick, our thought is, I can't even entertain the idea that they might die. Whether you think about it or not, people are going to die, they're going to die. But it's amazing how our lives become obsessive and preoccupied around what we are afraid might happen. And it's, if we really want to know God's will, we have to be okay with whatever he does. As soon as I am holding certain things back, as soon as I, and you know, I, I, one time I was speaking up at, at the youth camp and, uh, years ago, and I talked to them about, you need to take every area of your life and give it to the Lord and tell him, God, you can do anything you want in this area of my life. And I sent them off into the woods. And then I go, I'm going to do it too. So I went out, I'll never forget it, I was out there sitting by the little stream um, by the chapel, and it's beautiful, and I sat there and I went through. I, I know I've trusted my wife and my kids to the Lord. I know all my stuff, he could take it all away. I'm not attached to anything, but it hit me. My job as a pastor, it's like I haven't really given that to him because that was kind of almost a non-negotiable because I assume, well, this is what God wants me to do and this is where he wants me to do it. I, for, for many, many years, I was like, I'm going to be at Calvary Chapel until Chuck dies. You know, then I'll, I'll go and do something else. God was preparing my heart to be open to taking this church over 15 years ago. And, and it was a hard thing for me to do because I didn't want to do it. I, didn't, I, I wasn't at all feeling, you know, I want to get out there and be a senior pastor. The situation at the church was really a mess, and it was, there was really nothing that would make me do it except that I had told the Lord that day up in the mountains, I will do, my ministry is yours. I will do whatever you want me to do, including if you want me out of the ministry, I am okay with that. And as I prayed that, I just felt a real freedom. And then, like, it was just a short time after that that, the Lord opened the door for the need at Pacific Hills, and, you know, I came and became the pastor. But, you know, I think if I had just thought I knew, you know, there are certain things I just won't do, I, I could have missed what God ultimately wanted to do in my life. So trusting in the Lord with all of your heart means anything that he wants to do in my life, I'm okay with it. See, it takes the pressure off. If I'm like oh, I've got this decision, and this one's horrible, and what if this happens, and how? If I really can get myself to the point where I just want his will, and I don't care if it means I lose everything that I have, I don't care if it means it disrupts my life, or people don't like me anymore, or it, you know, how it affects the people around me, I'm okay with all of that. I am going to trust him with everything within me. And it's such an important preliminary step, really, and, and a central part to the process of him directing our path is, am I okay with anything? So in any area of your life, ask yourself, do I trust him with all of my heart? Will I be okay with whatever he ends up doing or trying to do? And to me, I find it useful and, and, and beneficial toward me not being ruled by fear when I just think of the worst thing that could happen. And I go, if that happened, am I okay with it? If that's where God leads me? And when I get to the point where I can go, yeah, that's fine. If I lose everything, if I'm alone, or if I die or whatever, I'm okay with it because I trust him. And again, you have to get past the superstition that you think that if you go, you know what, I would be okay to die right now when you get sick. Death, not a problem. That doesn't make you die, okay? You gotta, just like if you say, if God called me to go to Afghanistan and, and witness to the radical Muslims, it doesn't mean he's gonna make you do that, but what would you do if that's something that he wanted you to do? 
if you say, I won't do that, then that very fear is what's controlling you and you're not free to really hear his will. Most of the things that we say we would never do, he wouldn't call us to do anyhow. But trusting in the Lord with all of our heart means I give this whole thing to you and everything I have is yours. And in my future belongs to you. Whatever could happen is okay to my kids, to my grandkids, to my spouse, to my friends, to my church, to, to myself, to my health, whatever, is just to be able to go, God, I, I trust you. So I'm with you. And like Job, I want to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Because that is a powerful position. When you get to where there isn't anything that you're dreading or fearing or that it's going to throw you off, it doesn't make it happen. It sets you free from that anxiety. And so trust in the Lord with all your heart. And then lean not on your own understanding. To me, this is, this is maybe the hardest part of what he says. You can't figure it all out. Now remember, Solomon has told us, you need to get knowledge, you need to get counsel, you need to listen to what other people have to say, you need to pray, you need to be in the word. Yeah, we have all these things, but when it comes down to it, you will not figure out what God wants you to do. It's not a puzzle that you're meant to solve, because at some point, you just have to go, okay, I've done what I'm supposed to do, and now I'm just going to make a decision. And I'm not going to defend it, and I'm not going to go back on it. There are some people who are just afraid to make decisions. There are people who cannot order in a restaurant, and they change their mind 10 times, and then the food comes, and they're like, I wish I had got what you got. Here, fine, you know, I'll eat your kale or whatever. But, you know, it's, you're not going to figure it out, so stop trying. You will wear yourself out the harder you think, the more you're going to think of all kinds of reasons why, you know, you shouldn't do what it is that you really feel like God wants you to do. So you can't figure it out. Nobody else can figure it out. You do your homework. You do your research. You get your counsel. And you come to a point where, okay, I'm not going to have pluses and minuses of both and add them up and compute and figure it out. Just make the stinking decision. Don't lean on, I need to know everything. Because every decision involves some things that you don't know. You don't know the future. You don't know what's going to happen. Trust in him with all your heart. You're okay with whatever he does. Lean not on your own understanding. Don't think that you're always going to be able to figure out and know for sure that this is the best decision. This is what you need to do. And then all your ways acknowledge him. What does that mean? Literally, in, in Hebrew... It, it, in all your ways, knowledge him really is literally, in all your ways, know him. And I think that's really important. Because like, whatever happens, whatever I do, whatever he does, whatever somebody else does, I am going to know him better as I go through this process. So ultimately, I am not motivated by some external outcome. My motivation is, whatever happens... I'm going to know a little bit more about him. I am going to find out, even when I go through a horrible trial, a painful experience, I am determined that I'm going to know God better as a result of what I'm going through. And then he'll direct your path. He's going to lead you. He's going to guide you. And then we'll actually be in this passage on this Sunday, John 16, but Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit guides you into truth. He will tell you things that are coming. He knows the future. He comes alongside of you to help. So when you combine Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 in the process of trusting God and not, you know, not trying to figure it out and determining to know him, his direction will be the Holy Spirit actually leading and guiding you. And, uh, you know... He, sometimes it just has to come down to just make a decision. When, when you know that the Holy Spirit is going to lead you, and you're a Christian, he lives inside of you. Believe me, he leads you in a subtle way. The, the, John, Jesus in John chapter 3 talks about the Holy Spirit like the wind. It's like, hmm, you kind of see where it comes and where it goes, but you, you don't really understand it. You can't really figure it out. But you have to understand, Jesus promised 
that the Holy Spirit will lead you. So if you're doing what he tells you to do, trust him and make the call, make the decision. I don't believe that, you know, when people are like, okay, God, should I move to Arizona or Florida? I don't think God cares whether you move to Arizona or Florida. I think either one could be fine. I don't think you can do one and then go, I should have done the other one. I don't think there's, God's not limited. God's everywhere. So a lot of times we make decision making a lot more complicated than it needs to be. I think a lot of times we're going, God, please show me what you want me to do. And God's like, what do you want to do? Just do it. You know, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. He is leading you. Not only that, we've got Romans 8, 28. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You know what that means to me? I will never know if I made a bad decision, ever, because God works it out for good. So do, you know, I've told some of you before that I once asked Pastor Chuck, I said, I see you make some decisions that are really just stupid, and then it works out miraculously. And I said, what is it? Do you have a special insight into God's will, or does God just cover your butt? And Chuck chuckled, and he goes, maybe a little of each, I don't know. <laughs> and I, that's the way it is for all of us. He covers us so well. Just make the decision and get on with your life. Because if you can't decide, you just decided. You decided not to make a decision. And now you're giving it over into other people's hands. You may miss some opportunities that you should have jumped at when you had the time. You shouldn't be afraid to make decisions. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. If you are following the kinds of principles that we've seen in the scriptures here, just make the call. Just do it. There's a great book called Blink where they did research in the fact that people who make quick decisions almost always make better decisions than people who take a long time making a decision. And this is people who aren't even Christians. So if the truth is that every human has, you know, a better intuition than they do computing skills, then you add the Holy Spirit to that, and we should just be able to lit freely. And that's one thing that, that always kind of baffled me about Pastor Chuck, because I've always been told that, oh, you know, when you have a decision, you need to just pray and seek the Lord. And do. He wouldn't do that. You ask him a question, he would go, eh, do this. And, and yet, he was a man of prayer. He spent lots of time in prayer, but he didn't spend a bunch of time praying over individual decisions because he wasn't afraid to make a mistake. He made plenty of them. But at the same time, he knew that God was there and God was going to take care of him, and he wasn't going to waste a bunch of time and energy on the decision-making process, and I don't think we should either. Sometimes you just have to trust the Holy Spirit and just go for it. Because when you're waiting to make a decision, it weighs on you. It actually causes you to make other bad decisions. To not decide is to decide. So do your best to walk with God. You have the Holy Spirit working in you. Just decide. Just make it happen. And then finally, and we don't have time to look at these verses, but checking your work. If you're making decisions, here's how you can get an idea of whether or not what you did was, was wise or not. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. When you're led by the Spirit, Paul says, the result in your life is going to be love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. So if you look back at your life, if you want to analyze your decision-making process up to this point, ask yourself, has it led to more love? Has it led to more joy, to more peace? And that's just a good little cross-check to be able to say, I haven't been making wise decisions because I'm not seeing the fruit of the Spirit in my life. At the same time, you can have people criticizing your decision making, and sometimes they are just angry, bitter people, and you're somebody who's enjoying your life, who's happy. If you have love in your life, if you have joy in your life, if you have peace in your life, and these are all relative, none of us are perfect in these areas, but you see that fruit growing, it's like, I must have made some good decisions somewhere along the way, combined with, as the Holy Spirit led me and as God covered me, um, I think I'm on the right track. But if you're an angry, bitter person, hateful, and you don't like being around people, and your life is miserable, 
take a look back and figure out how have you been making your decisions? Because it is possible to make decisions that you're going to pay for. So the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, is a good, is a good test case. And then I also put in James 3.17, where you know, James talks about the difference between wisdom from above and the wisdom that's from beneath. And, and I'll just read it to you really quickly. Because to me, this is, you, you look at your decision and you see what the result is. And here's a little checklist really quickly. Uh, first of all, he says, the wisdom from beneath is bitter and envious and selfish and boasting and lying against the truth. But where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion, every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You can look at your decisions afterwards and say, did this lead to that? Or did all hell break loose when I made this kind of a decision? So these two scriptures, look them over, memorize them, or put them in the inside of your Bible, and just check. You can, when somebody is living their life, you can look at their life and tell whether they are wise or not. If you, you should never be in close association with people who are angry and bitter and mean and selfish and narcissistic and all, because they obviously don't have the wisdom that's from above. You want to be around people who are loving and peaceful, reasonable, negotiable. Um, it's pretty easy to tell, you know, when those traits come up. And so all of this kind of put together, I hope this little outline gives you something to go on, just a little checklist to run through, especially when you have a big decision, but practice on little decisions and see how, you know, see how it works because you have the Spirit of God in you. You have everything that you need to make wise choices and therefore to have a fruitful life. And ultimately, if you're doing what he tells you to do, you can trust him. And you should never be you know, stressed out over decisions that you have to make. If you're making a decision but you're really stressed about it, the truth is you probably already know what you're supposed to do and you just don't want to do it. Just do what's right. Make it simple. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Such a, a wealth of wisdom is here in your word, and we thank you for making it so clear to us. And God, I pray that you will give us the faith, the courage, the character, that we will choose to live a life of wisdom, that we will opt for listening to what you would lead us to do by your spirit instead of being in constant rebellion against everything that makes sense, against everything that's wise, against everything that would be good for us. We all have that sin inside of us, but help us to start making better choices when the, the lies of the enemy try to destroy us. Thank you, thank you for this evening. Bless everyone who gave of their time to come out here and, and do a little bit of thinking on how do we find out your will and do it? Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, hope to see you Sunday. We're in John 16. It's an amazing passage, too.